Upgrading your transmission from multiple chainrings to a one by setup is a popular way of simplifying your bike, reducing some weight and also adding some performance gains. In today's video, we're going to look at everything you need to consider when migrating from a multiple chainring setup to that simplified one by system. As far as transmissions go, the trend these days tends to be a one by setup. That means a single chainring at the front with anything up to 12 gears available at the rear. But previously, mountain bikes would have anything from three chainrings at the front and fewer gears at the rear. And it's still seen on a lot of bikes like this entry level bike just behind me here. Something we're asked about quite often is how you make the move from a multiple chainring setup with fewer gears at the rear over towards the one by setup. So we've teamed up with Shimano to make this video and show you everything on the table that you need to understand and consider in order to make your bike that simplified one by setup. Okay, well firstly, why on earth would you wanna go for a one by system when you've got two or three gears on the front that work perfectly well? Well, the fact is there's a lot of things to benefit from the one by system. The first one is you're gonna lose a load of weight from your bike. So simply by removing chain rings, removing that front derailleur, even the steel inner and outer cables and the shifter at the bar, it's all considerable weight that you can just do without um, if that's gonna suit the way you ride. Next up is the simplicity. You're gonna be removing things from your bike. It looks nice and clean, nice and neat. You don't have additional things going on on your bike. And also it's far less confusing as well. Have you ever considered before for a novice or an entry level rider coming into mountain bikes with two sets of derailleurs, two sets of shifters that actually work in opposite directions, how confusing that actually is. No longer with the one by system, just one gear um, with two clickers, one to go easy, one to go hard. Nice and simple to understand. And then arguably from a frame design perspective, a bit more complicated here, you can make better bikes. Uh, not necessarily so with a hardtail frame, but in terms of suspension bikes, it's always been very complicated to sort of shoehorn in multiple gears, a derailleur, uh, and of course the pivot point down there. And in the past, many manufacturers have had to skew their pivot points to one side, making an asymmetrical design, which not only can it put strain on the bearings, but you end up with a suspension design that's not quite optimized. Uh, these days with a single chaining at the front, there's more clearance, there's more stability, there's better pivots. It just works better. Okay, so the one by essentials then. There's really just two major components that you need to commit to to go one by. And that would be a narrow wide chain ring and a derailleur that has a clutch system on there. So let's just look at the two items so you can understand how they work. Now the narrow wide chain ring differs from traditional chain rings in the fact that traditional chain rings, the profile of the teeth pretty much looks the same. If you're looking at a chain ring that's on a chain set like this, uh, these will have profile differences in order for the derailleur to change gear, but on a single chain ring, it doesn't need to do that. So with the narrow wide chain rings, you have alternating profiles and teeth that literally fill the void on the chain. If the chain can't rattle around, it can't unhook and can't come off basically. So it's a really secure way of keeping the chain on brilliant system. If you're going one by, you're going to need a single chain ring that's compatible in this way on the front. Now the good news is you can get chain rings online from around as little as 20 quid, but the problem you have is the amount of different varieties they are. Now we're going to get into this a little bit later in the video, but you just may not be able to fit a single chain ring on a multiple chain ring setup like this one. So like I said, we'll pick that one up. And the next one to consider is the rear derailleur. Now all derailleurs have a sprung lower cage on them, but the clutch derailleur has a very strong spring that actually puts tension on this bottom part of the chain. Now the key to stopping the chain coming off in combination with the narrow wire chain ring is forcing some additional tension on the lower cage here. Because when the chain comes off, typically on a system, it will unravel from the bottom. So by having that clutch mech on there, you're almost guaranteed to minimize that chance of the chain coming off. And a derailleur like the Shimano Deal 11 speed clutch unit, uh, you can get this for around 40 pounds online. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the different ways that you can go one by on your bike. Now the simplest option would be to just go for a one by chain ring and leave everything else the same, right? Well, it's not quite that simple. So this bike, for example, has nine gears on the rear and has two on the front. Now you might notice that the, the cranks on here doesn't have replaceable chain rings. 
So that means you don't have the ability to remove these and have a single chain ring on here. So it's gonna cost you more if you wanna go that route. Now, chain rings come in various different bolt circle diameters, which is known as the BCD. So when you're looking at chain rings online, you'll see different ones referred to. 104 is a common one. However, you do need to check this compatibility with your crank. Some cranks will have a direct mount chain ring that goes straight on there. If you're lucky enough to have a crank that has one of those, you're gonna be in luck because you should be able to find one, whether it's a Shimano one that's gonna fit on a Shimano crank or another brand online, you will have the ability to go one by with this method. But something important to say, if you're just gonna do this and keep your existing gears on the back, so for argument's sake, if I was gonna go one by on this and not change the gears at the back, Granted, you are losing weight by going for a one by at the front, but you're also losing out on gear range. Now, one of the whole points of going for a one by system is by removing gears at the front and adding some at the rear. So you have the simplicity of just a single gear shifter, all of your gears at the rear, but you're losing weight at the same time. By doing this and not changing the gears at the rear, of course, you're missing out on this gear range. Now, the gear range on this particular bike, it's got an 1136 cassette on the rear, and it's got a 22 and a 36 tooth gear at the front. So that equates to approximately 535% gear range. If I was gonna remove the gears at the front and just have a single chain ring on there, you've only got the ratio of the rear, so that's 327%. So as you can see, it's quite a big difference there. Whereas if you're gonna to migrate to a one by 11 system and have the bigger cassette at the rear with up to a 51 tooth sprocket on there, so it's a really good climbing gear, you've got 463% gear range. So it's much closer, although it's not quite there, but it's much closer to what you have with this setup. So bear that in mind if you wanna go that route. Now also, if you're gonna to go to a one by system without changing anything at the rear, you're only capitalizing on having a narrow eye chain ring on the front by doing this, but you're not gonna have the clutch mech on the back. And like I said, the key to the system is a clutch mech in combination with a narrow wide chain ring. Now I've actually made a trail side video where I basically experimented. I tried a narrow wide, a non narrow wide chain ring, a conventional one, clutch, on and clutch off. So I tried all combinations out on the trail just to see how effective they were. It's quite surprising. So that video is gonna be in the link underneath if you actually wanna see the effect of this stuff real time out on the trails. Okay, next up, the chain line. Now this is really important with the one by setup, but what exactly is your chain line? Right, it's a measurement that's taken from the center of your seat tube to the center of the chain ring. And that is so crucial to how smoothly your gears operate and also to avoid dropping the chain. If you have a poor chain line, that means it could be too far out or too far in. There's a number of things that can happen. You'll get bad gears, you'll get bad alignment, but also the chain ring could be too far away from the frame or too close to the frame, causing different problems themselves. Now the chain line differs when you get rear end changing in size. So obviously as one thing moves over, you have to move the chain to compensate. Now there's four rear end options on mountain bikes. Now this one has a 135 millimeter rear end. Uh, you also get 142 millimeters. More commonly these days on most production bikes are sort of above entry level, you will see Boost, which is 148 millimeters. And you might have heard of Super Boost, which is 157 millimeter. Now Super Boost is not that common. You will see it here and there. So, 142 and 148 will be slightly more common out there. 135, you don't see that much these days. Uh, this entry level bike does have it, however, so it's a good use in this video. So these are the numbers that you need to get to to go one by on your bike. So if you've got a 135 or a 142 millimeter back end, you need to ideally look between 48 and 50 millimeters for your chain line. Obviously it will vary slightly on your particular bike, but they're the numbers you wanna to get to. Now, if your bike is a 148, boost spec on the rear there. You need to aim between 51 and 53 millimeters. However, on some bikes, it can be up to 55 millimeters. Uh, Yeti, for example, I think have some bikes that have abnormally wide uh, chain stays on them to give loads of clearance at the bottom bracket, in which case they use the 55 millimeter. And finally, if you're using Super Boost, which is 157 millimeters, you need to look as wide as 56 and a half millimeters. Uh, now these aren't always the case. You will find some bikes, some anomalies out there, but that's a good guideline to get a good chain line on whatever bike you're gonna to convert to a one by. Now to get a good chain line, this can be achieved in a few different ways. 
Now, firstly, it can be down to the crank. So Shimano, for example, they will refer to their chain line uh, on the cranks themselves. So you can buy the cranks in 55, 56 and a half, uh, 51 to 53, etc. You will have that marked on the packaging or on the website you're gonna buy it from. Uh, so pay attention to that when you're buying to make sure it's compatible with the rear end of your bike. Of course, you can put any old thing on and yes, you'll get it working, but it's never gonna be perfect unless you get the chain line right. The other option is by getting an offset chain ring. Now the offset chain ring, again, you have to apply the compensation depending on what particular rear end you have. And finally, if you're gonna go it alone and use a single chain ring on a multiple chain ring setup, i.e. by removing rings and putting an aftermarket chain ring on there, if, for example, you have a double chain ring setup, it's gonna be up to you to space the chain ring out to get as close as possible to your optimal chain line. Again, Try your best to get the chain line on the money and your gears will work really well. Okay, so what about your rear wheel in terms of the way the cassette fits to it? Because on top of the four different widths out back, you've got different mounting systems available to you. Now, unless your bike is particularly old, it's fairly likely you're gonna have anything from nine speed upwards on the back. So this bike has nine gears on the back, so that'll be referred to as nine speeds. Now the good news is with the Shimano system, in fact the spline system overall, which is pretty much still the market leader, eight, nine and 10 speed all fit on the same spline bodies. Now most of the time, you can always get an 11 speed to fit on here as well. Uh, now there will be anomalies with this. Shimano once produced a 10 speed version of this uh, that was exclusive to 10 speed. Uh, but like I said, most of the time you can fit an 11 speed on there. Now, if you wanna hop up to 12 speed though with Shimano, there are a few more things you need to take into consideration. Now, one of the benefits of going for 12 speed is you get a much bigger gear range. Uh, you can get up to 51 on the top end, which you can achieve on 11 speed, but you can't get the higher end that you can with the 12 speed. So the highest gear you can get on 11 speed and down will be that 11 tooth at the bottom. On the 12 speed, you get the 10 tooth. You might argue that it doesn't give you that much more, but really you can get a 510% gear range with that single ring on the front. It's a massive range of gears and a significant increase. However, to achieve this, Shimano had to redesign the hub to compensate for this, to actually get it to install correctly. So no longer will you be able to use the spline system, you have to use the micro spline system, which arguably is a much better system. But as we all know, because technology comes in at the top end, it may not actually filter down to older systems like the 135 on the back there, at least not on a budget level when there's things like 11 speed available to you. Now Shimano has four 12 speed transmissions available out there. You've got Dior, SLX, XT and the Range Topping XTR. Now the benefits you get in going for those is you can pick and choose between the components. They're all completely interchangeable. You could have, for example, the cheapest Chaney cassette and you could have the fancy XTR derailleur if that's what your cup of tea was. Uh, the point is it's all interchangeable, but you will need to have a micro spline compatible rear hub. Now, to fit one on this particular bike, which has a 135 mil quick release rear end, uh, the only option I could find online at the moment was this DT Swiss HU1900, uh, which is a fantastic wheel, but it's an additional cost to factor in. In this case, going for 11 speed with Shimano would be a better choice using the existing wheel on the bike. Now, of course, there are some aftermarket brands out there that do offer some cheaper products you can find out there. But bear in mind uh, that it really is better most of the time to go for a proper system available to you. It's always gonna work better and it's gonna be fully optimized. Okay, and there's one last thing you need to consider as well, and it's what you do with your shifter. Now, on some bikes, you might find that your left-hand shifter that you would be removing to go one by uh, is part of the brake lever, in which case you're gonna have three options available to you. Uh, one would be to just leave it there, redundant, just dangling away, annoying you. Uh, the other option would be to be quite bold and get the hacksaw out. Of course, that is uh, gonna invalidate any warranty you might have left, uh, but it is a common thing we see people doing. And the other option would be laying out more money and getting a new left-hand brake lever. Okay then, so what about the costing? So, 
To convert this bike behind me to a one by system, we're left with a few options in the Shimano range. So the first one is just by changing the chainring itself, so the bare minimum out there. As you, as you know, this one, you can't do anything with the chain set that's on here, so that will be removing that and putting a deal crank set on there. Uh, the 10 speed option I referred to earlier is approximately 55 quid online, so that's your bare minimum option on there. So that would work great. Uh, of course, you have the limitations of not having the full system with the clutch on there. The next option would be to go to a 1x11 system. So you're going to be paying out for a Shimano Dior rear derailleur, the equivalent chain and cassette, the crank set with that chain ring, and the left-hand shifter. Uh, it's all part of a package there. And then, of course, if you wanted to go the whole hog and opt for the 1x12 system, you're going to have to have the same equivalent in the new Dior 12-speed range. So that would be the Dior derailleur with the clutch on there, the Dior chain, and the Dior cassette, same thing, the crank and chain ring and the shifter, but you're also going to need a compatible wheel or at the very least a hub in order to mount that cassette. So that's an additional cost on top of there. Okay, now, although it's very easy for me at this stage to convert this to one by 11 and we have the componentry here to do so, because of the fact I've got a 12-speed compatible hub, I'm actually going to convert this from 2x9 to 1x12, just to show you how different the rear hub is in terms of what it offers on the bike. Now, also in this video, I'm just going to show you the difference between putting the 9-speed cassette and the 11-speed cassette on the same rear body there, just to show you that works. And also, just the difference in removing a multiple chainring crank from the bike is very different from the simplicity that you have with a 1x crank. As far as the rest of the installation goes, we've got dedicated videos out there for Shimano components. In particular, setting up and indexing the rear derailleur, making your shifting perfect, that's right down there, as is installing a cassette and a chain right down there. So you can check those ones out and you should be able to install everything with no problems. Okay, so before I show you how to fit the 12-speed cassette on the micro-spline system, I'm actually just going to show you how to fit the 11-speed cassette on the same hub that would accept the 8, 9, and 10-speed cassettes. So what you're looking for here on the back of the cassette, you'll find a series of spline interfaces. Look for the big one and look for the same one on the actual cassette body itself, and you want that to directly correlate. You'll find it will slot in place. Slide that in place and make sure, depending on the cassette model you have, uh, sometimes it will be a single piece, sometimes it will have spaces in between them. You just make sure the spaces are in the correct places. Obviously, there needs to be enough sufficient gap between the sprockets. Now, the lock nut you've got to take care with because the threads are very fine on it and they can be cross-threaded. So, best advice would be make sure everything's sat in place and just back it out slightly, just until you can feel where the edge of the thread is and then go in the correct way. And it's at that point, then you want to get your adjustable spanner and securely tighten it. Now you probably notice I just use an adjustable spanner and a cassette tool in order to tighten the lock ring and now that will be sufficient but if you have access to a torque wrench, 40 newton meters is what you're looking for at this point. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how to migrate from an actual multiple chain ring chain set through to a one by style chain set. What you've got to bear in mind with these older style chain sets is typically they won't have self-extracting bolts built into them. And unlike the Shimano system that you see on the Holotech cranks that we're going to install, uh, they're a bit more complicated to get off. So you will need um, a flat headed screwdriver or a pick, something just to take the cap off. You're going to need a 14 mil socket and you will need a crank puller. Now this is a crank extracting tool and it has two sets of threads on it. So one of them will thread into the crank itself and then once that is tight and secure, you will then tighten the tool against it and that pulls the crank off the bottom bracket axle. Uh, sounds a bit of a complicated thing, but these were once upon a time commonplace in the mountain bike world. So let's just get in a bit closer and we'll show you how to do it. Okay, so first up, you wanna make it easy for yourself and get the bike into the lowest chain ring. That gives you direct access. If you try and take the crank off when it's in the outer chain ring, the chain's gonna foul on the derailleur. Just make it a bit difficult for yourself. Now at this point, you just wanna lever the, the cap off just carefully. And as you can see, there's the 14 mil head underneath there. Gotta remove that to get access to the threads in the crank itself. Okay, so just a case of counterclockwise. Again, you've got to be delicate with this because these threads are very fine, as are the threads on the inside there. And then no need to excessively tighten it, it's just to stop the tool coming loose. Just hold it in place. Then you tighten against the tool, and hey presto, your crank arm will start coming off. Now you're going to need to use the crank arm for some leverage. 
and there we go. Uh, and then just repeat the process for the left hand crank, which generally is far easier. You haven't got the chain rings or anything else to interfere with. Again, taking the same care to thread that crank puller in place. Now, probably one of the best things about upgrading to a dedicated 1x12 or 1x11 system from an older design like this is getting rid of these horrendous old square taper cranks. Now, square taper cranks and bottom bracket as an interface is just, just gives me terrible memories of working in bike shops. And I've just got to one now that I'm gonna have to rely on this big old bar. So the traditional bottom bracket tool, quality tool, no doubt, but the problem isn't the tool, it's the way it actually interfaces with the bottom bracket. It's got a very shallow depth, which means it's very likely that when you're putting a load of torque into it, if it's been over tightened, or if it's been in there a long time, for the tool to slip. So you've gotta be super careful at this stage, both for your own safety and protection, and also because you don't wanna damage the actual teeth on it because you need it to grip to get it out. So I'm gonna start by doing the non-drive side and then the drive side cup. And obviously when you're putting the fresh ones back in, you would do drive side and then you would do non-drive side. Uh, just a little thing to remember when you're loosening and tightening your bottom bracket is it goes the opposite way to the pedals. So your pedals will tighten towards the front of the bike and loosen towards the rear of the bike. So that's for both of them. And your bottom bracket is the opposite. It will tighten to the rear of the bike and loosen to the front of the bike. Now let me explain to you why upgrading to the Shimano one by dedicated system is so much better. So think about that bottom bracket system that I just took out really difficult to remove, and that was one that had been factory fitted fairly recently. You imagine what they'd been like if they'd been in a bike several years of hard use. It can become really difficult to get out. Now, these style Shimano bottom brackets, you have external bearings, so the bearings are bigger. They're not actually on the inside of the cup, so set outboard. The bearings are bigger, they can support your axle wider apart, and more importantly, they're so easy to fit. Now, you've got two types of tools you can use to fit them. You can have the better value all in one tool that has one tool on the end here for securing the bottom bracket and then it also has built onto the end the preload tool and i'll explain to you what that is for in a second your other option is to get one that fits a socket if that's your preferred method a bit pricier to buy those but if you've got loads of sockets and stuff it works out quite well and then you can get a secondary tool to adjust the preload cap there now the beauty of this system is how easy it all comes together you have the axle that's part of the right hand crank. You have the direct mount chain ring on there. It literally slides through the bottom bracket. The left hand crank slides onto it. You have the preload cap that tightens up. Imagine it like, a bit like a headset, really. Uh, that will adjust in place. And then you have the pinch bolts to secure it. So easy to adjust, so easy to set up. And it really is a fit and forget system. Just gonna put a dab of grease in the uh on the threads in the bottom bracket shell there. Depending on the size of your bottom bracket shell and the orientation of your frame and the clearance and how you're getting your Q factor, you may need to put some spacers on the bottom bracket there. Um, obviously you need to make sure you get that correct for your particular setup. Preload nut goes on next. Now you don't have to go crazy tight on this, it's only to take up the tension in the system. There we go. And then twin five mil pinch bolts. Isn't that a better system? One more thing just to emphasize, if you do have to change your wheel, you've got to make sure you're getting a wheel with the correct disc rotor mount on there. So the standard is a six bolt, but you will see this mount cropping up. This is known as center lock. This is what Shimano uh, patented as their own pattern and it's now starting to creep out everywhere. Now center lock is a very good system and it also uses the same bottom bracket tool that you will also need to install the bottom bracket, which is cool. However, it can be incredibly difficult, I mean, Funnily enough, the budget wheel actually had a center lock rotor on there. It can become very difficult to find the specifics to convert to 12 speed if your bike has 135, but that's what we've managed to find here. So it's a DT Swiss wheel with micro spline on there and it has center lock and it's a 135 quick release. So uh, by all accounts, a pretty rare style of wheel for a bike configuration, but just an additional thing to pay attention to when you're searching for components. Now with the micro spline system, you just need to pay attention to the last one here. Uh, so this little 10 tooth actually sits, instead of sitting onto the splines like the rest of them do, it actually sits into the next tooth up. That's nicely into place there. Drop your lock ring in there. 
And again, you want it nice and tight. You don't want it so tight you can't remove the thing, okay? So if you're gonna use a torque wrench, that's 40 newton meters. And of course that does make sense, but you don't have to use one. When I'm installing a fresh derailleur, I actually like to adjust my higher limit screw just before I put the chain on because I can see really clearly uh, exactly where the sprocket is in relation to the upper guide wheel. Now, if you want to know a bit more about fine tuning a rear derailleur, getting the indexing perfect, I've got a video for that. It's just right underneath there. And that's with all Shimano derailleurs, whatever the level. Now, if you're wondering about how you size your chain for your bike, uh, it depends basically on this type of bike that you have. But for a hardtail with a Shimano 12 speed system, you want to run the chain outside of the derailleur, so not through the derailleur, around the biggest sprocket and the sprocket at the front. And then what you're looking for on a hardtail is four to five links uh, plus the joining link, basically. So each one of these would count as a link. Uh, you split the chain, then you use the joining link. Uh, and then of course it will vary for full suspension bikes and stuff. If you want to know a bit more about the size in the chain for different styles of bike, we have got a video for that. So there'll be one floating around somewhere underneath. Okay, and when selecting your shifter, whether that's 10 speed, 11 speed, 12 speed, you've got to make sure it's one that's going to be compatible with your bike. Now this one, for example, is a Dior 12 speed one. I'm not going to be able to fit this on this bike because of the fact it's got the iSpec system. Now this is Shimano's direct mount system. That means you don't have to have a separate mounting clamp and it basically mounts direct to the brake lever. So it's a super neat system. But as you can see on here, the brake levers that are on this bike are different. So I'm not going to be able to use that. So I need to use the one with the clamp on system like the one that's already on here. Okay, all there is to do now is really just um, a quick index of the gears, make sure everything is running sweet, get some pedals on and ride the bike. Now, if you want a more detailed video on the specifics of indexing your gears and adjusting the limit screws and the B screw, uh, there's one of those as well down there for any Shimano derailleur. And I'm sure there's more than one of two of you that will have questions a bit more specific in relation to chain line, compatibility options, specific chain rings, all that sort of stuff. Uh, if you do, please get involved in the comments underneath. And if there's enough questions, we'll compile them into a weekly ask show uh, so we can deal with uh, upgrading to one by in a bit more specific detail for you. Uh, hopefully this video has been helpful for you. Uh, let us know what you think in the comments. Give us a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe if you don't already do that and support us in the shop as well. And we'll see another video soon. Ta-ra.